Good morning everyone, I am Mr. Ish. Thank you for joining me for this video. I want to use this video as a means for going back several steps into the area of pre-calculus and we'll look at some graphs that are interesting in terms of their presentation. And these are graphs that I've not really gone into too heavily or in some cases I may not have gone into them at all. And I'm going to use this video to expand our knowledge base with regards to these graphs. The first graph I'm going to look at is something which looks in this form f of x is equal to x to the power of n where n is an even number. You know very frequently we've looked at x squared but we're looking at here where the n is an even number so we're looking at items which look like or graphs which look like x to the 4, x to the 6 or x to the 8 and then you can keep taking it to however large of a number x to the 100. These are the types of graphs you should be relatively familiar with. You would always start with something which looks like an x square and you know it would be this basic standard graph a parabola. As you increase the exponent like from square going up to 4 the graph would become something like this. This right here is x square x to the 4 and you know nothing here is drawn to scale this is just a representation. You would have a little bit more of a bowing of your curve and then if you we can even skip x to the 6 and go to x to the 8 you would have a, a bit more of a bowing effect. As you increase the power of the exponent in terms of it being an even number like to 100 what would eventually happen is you would have such a bowing and a vertical extension such that your eventual graph would look something like this more of a square or rectangular presentation right over here and eventually you'd see you'd always be hovering around and I'm not drawing this in terms of a as in toad by any means I'm just using this as a means of representation you'd always be hovering around in terms of a curve around 1 and minus 1 that's what would eventually happen but you would end up seeing that the original parabolic curve would in the base of the curve it would extend out this way but the top part of the curve would extend inward this way so that you end up getting this bit of a rectangular effect come over here a rectangular effect and then you end up having a relatively rectangular curve develop as the exponent increases in character we're looking here only at the evens you can have a similar effect play out here with regards to the odd curves the odd exponent curve so let's show you that when you're looking at similar curves like this but now here we're looking at an odd number we're looking at x cubed x to the 5 x to the 9 x to the 99 you want to start here with a basic cubic function which looks something like this you know minus infinity to positive infinity in terms of the domain and the range this right here is an x cube let's jump over here to x to the 9 what would end up happening is you'll have a, a bit more of a bowing effect of your curve it would bow out and by bowing I mean it flattens out some more over here x to the 9 maybe a curve which is like x to the 33 would have a bit more of a bowing character you see it tends to cling more here on the x-axis and then something like x to the power of 99 would be such that you would have that rectangular effect play out and we can remove some of this curve right over here and show you you'd end up having something like this play out right here like this what would eventually happen is this lower part of the uh, curve is bowing outwards and becoming flat along the x-axis the top part of the curve is trying to bend inwards as you progress along these exponents from an odd character but you see it becomes more of a rectangular and then over here you could see again this x equals minus 1 and x equals 1 you'd kind of be hovering around these imaginary lines right over here they're not as towards, but you'd be hovering around there with regards to how your curve is and that's especially as the character of this exponent increases and you know it's a similar effect for even and now it's a similar effect for an odd we look at some more interesting graphs these ones over here I might have talked about but they are again very important and very interesting in terms of their relationship exponential and logarithmic both are inverses of one another you could say e to the x is inverse of natural log x if one is f of x the other one would be f minus one of x right f of x and then the other one would be inverse of that and think about it, it it's true if you look over here if y is equal to e to the x and you switch the letters around as you do in terms of the inverse determination then x is equal to e to the y 
right? Then you get rid of this exponent by bringing in the natural log. Natural log x is natural is equal to y. You know this exponent is coming down here as a coefficient y natural log e. Therefore, you can say natural log x is equal to y. So you've suddenly shown that what was originally an exponential is a logarithmic in terms of inverse. And then what was originally inverse, you can work backwards and show exponential. So these are one to one. And in terms of the graph, because we're talking about graphs, look over here, you will see the interesting aspect. The exponential function has a very important y-intercept, zero comma one. And the graph will look something like this. From minus infinity to positive infinity in terms of domain, but the range is from zero up to infinity. The natural log x will look something like this with a one comma zero, and you would have a curve, see here's my exponential curve right here, e to the x, but here's my natural log x curve right over here, which has, as you can see, a domain of zero to infinity, but a range of minus infinity to positive infinity. And what do inverses have a commonality of? Inverses have a symmetry about y equals x line. See, y equals x line, and both, uh, both of these are reflections or mirror images but are along a y equals x and that's a good characteristic of inverse inverse graphs or inverse functions are symmetric about this y equals x line and you can see here the exponential and you can see the logarithmic and these are additionally two very interesting graphs to be aware of they're one to one and they are inverses of one another another interesting set of inverse and original functions are the trigonometric functions I know I presented those, but I'll present them here again in terms of review because they are indeed interesting. If you look at f of x is equal to sine x, you know the inverse of sine x is arc sine x. You can even show that is equal to arc sine x. And I'll just show you here for just the sine version, if y is equal to sine x, you flip the letters around, x is equal to sine y, and you solve for y, y is equal to arc sine of x. See? You can do the same thing for your other trigonometric functions, but I'm just showing you this as I have in a previous video for sine. We look at sine, cosine, and tangent. If you restrict the domain for sine function from minus pi over 2 to positive pi over 2, and then you have the relative range value here, minus 1, 1, you know a sine function, an unaltered original sine function looks something coming from here like this. That's your original sine function because you can extend this on and it look like the typical sine curve that you're familiar with. But if you look at the inverse of this over the same domain, you know when you look at inverses, what was originally domain becomes a range. What was the range becomes your domain. These are things you already know. Here we'll have minus 1 to 1 and here we'll have pi over 2 to minus pi over 2. So the inverse sine function, now we're looking at this inverse, which you can look at and demonstrate to be this arc sine and this are exactly the same. If you look at this, you would have something which would look like this. Like that. So that, and these are inverses. They're inverses because you can superimpose this and this. These two graphs can be superimposed on a specific and a single graph and you'll have the y equals x symmetry play right in between. So let me superimpose both of these onto the same plot and you'll see exactly what I'm talking about. This is my original sine x. Here's my inverse sine of x. And then here is y equals x reflecting line or line of axis or line of symmetry. And then you can see both of these graphs. And that's a good characteristic of inverse functions. Inverse functions are symmetric about y equals x and you can see it. I'll show you the similar presentation here for cosine and t uh, tangent functions next. Let's look at cosine. f of x is equal to cosine x. And then the inverse of that is, as you know, cosine minus x, or you can say arc cosine, A or C, C or S, same. You know, you have to do the domain restriction. If you domain restrict from, let's say over here, for cosine, you have to restrict actually zero to pi. You can show a one-to-one -one relationship if you go from zero to pi. For cosine, you know, here's one, here's minus one. The basic cosine function, at zero, cosine is a value of one. At pi over two, it's a zero. At pi is a minus one. So this is what you end up having. And not 100% drawn to scale because I'm kind of off the dot there, but this is what the basic cosine function looks. 
and you can extend it on and make it look like the typical serpentine cosine function as you know. If you do the the inverse of it, which is an interesting graph to know, and that we're looking at is arc cosine x, you have to flip the domain in the range around. You'll have a minus 1 here, 0 here, 1 here, you'll have a 0 here, you'll have a pi over 2 here and a pi over here. Now the arc cosine graph is not too hard. A value for a certain angle, if you were to cosine and you get a minus 1 is pi, because cosine 180 is a minus 1. Cosine 90 is a 0, cosine of 0 is a 1. And now you're seeing exactly how this is playing out. Your graph would look something like this. Both of these would be mirror images or reflections. I shouldn't be using mirror image, but they would be reflections of each other across the y equals x line. I don't have to show it, but you can picture it. But again, these are two interesting graphs. Here's cosine and here's arc cosine. Graphs that you should be familiar with. We look at the tangent one next and the arc tan. f of x is equal to tan x is a very interesting and important graph. Then you know the inverse of that is tan minus 1x or arc tan x. You know this right here is the original function and this right here is the inverse of that function. And you can do it. If y is equal to tan x, flip the letters around. y equals tan x, then x is equal to tan y and solve for this y. y is equal to, you take tan on the other side, you get arc tan x. Or you can say inverse tan like this symbol and x. It's exactly the same thing. The beauty of the tan x is in terms of the graphing, it's easy. A very important landmark for tan x is you have the pi over 2 and minus pi over 2 vertical asymptotes. Why are these vertical asymptotes? Because if you think back to the tan function, you know tan is equal to sine x or cosine x. When you put 90 or minus 90 here, you, you end up getting a 1 over a 0 which is undefined in terms of being able to solve this. The presentation here, the calculation here is undefined, so you end up having vertical asymptotes right over here at minus pi over two and pi over two. So the tangent function looks something like this. That's your basic tangent function. The arc tangent or the inverse tangent is not hard. It's not hard by any means. What was originally the domain becomes a range and flip flop for the range. You now end up having right here, pi over 2 and minus pi over 2, y equals pi over 2 and y equals minus pi over 2 are your asymptote lines and your arc tan graph would look something like this. This is my arc tan of x. Not difficult by any means. For this graph right over here, the basic tangent, you know just within this specific part, the range is minus infinity to positive infinity and the domain is minus pi over 2 pi over 2 with circular parentheses. When you look over here, the range is minus pi over 2 positive pi over 2 with the circular parentheses because these are values going up to but not including these 90 degree angles. But the domain is minus infinity to positive infinity so everything flips as you know. Especially with this 1 to 1 and inverse effect, you have things flipping. But again, we're focusing here on the graph of interest. So the graph of interest here is the arc tangent. Now for the remainder of this video, I'm gonna expound on some hyperbolic graphs. These are graphs that have come up in terms of the limit questions on hyperbolic functions in terms of the video I presented on limits of hyperbolic functions. But here I'll look at them in slightly more detail. The first graph that you should be familiar with is, is f of x is equal to sine hx, hyperbolic sine graph. What does it look like? This is what your hyperbolic sine graph looks like. It has a domain of minus infinity to infinity because you could extend this laterally from the left to right side and go towards infinity. It'll have a range of a minus infinity to infinity. It's not a hard graph by any means. All right, this is my hyperbolic sine graph and you know, sine h of x is always equal to e to the x minus e to the minus x over 2. That's the basic definition. And this is what you'll have. Of. The landmark point on this is this, 0 comma 0. It's a landmark point because if you put an x value of 0 in any of these areas, you get 1 minus 1, which is a 0 over 2, and that's 0 is it all. So you get 0 comma 0. So this is the graph you should know. The next graph, which is an interesting one, is hyperbolic cosine. I remember the hyperbolic cosine as this. If the hyperbolic sine looks like a cubic, the hyperbolic cosine looks like a parabolic, a quadratic graph, except it has this important landmark point right over here. It looks something like this. 
and I would say this landmark point is 0 comma 1 and I'll show you why. First, the domain is minus infinity to infinity because it's going to extend in the lateral aspects from minus x to positive x along the infinity. This does not look like a very interesting infinity, but let's make it clear. The range is going to be 1 comma infinity, 1 comma infinity, 1 is actually a point on the curve. How do we know? Look at the basic definition of a cosine hyperbolic. If x is 0, you plug in zeros over here, you'll have e to the 0 plus e to the minus 0, which is the same thing as 0 over 2. You have a 2 over 2 play out and you get a 1. Hence, you get this point 0 comma 1, which is this point right over here, your y-intercept, and a very good vertex type of point on this graph. So this right here is your landmark point, 0 comma 1. So that's a hyperbolic cosine. Let's look at this hyperbolic cosecant h. You can say cosecant hx or hyperbolic cosecant x. You know hyperbolic cosecant is the same thing as you're looking at 1 over sine hx. If you were to look at it in terms of its definition e to the x minus e to the minus x over 2, what will you get? You get 2 over e to the x minus e to the minus x, right? You flip everything around. How does it look like in terms of its graph? Because now we have to look at the graph aspect because we're looking at graphs of interest but beyond just looking at them, we're actually learning the basic characteristics of these graphs. In terms of domain, the hyperbolic cosine, hyperbolic, I'm sorry, hyperbolic cosecant, cosecant hyperbolic, it has a domain from minus infinity up to zero, but not including it, and then zero onwards to infinity. The range is exactly the same, minus infinity up to a zero, not including it, and then zero up to infinity because of this break. Why do we have the break? We have the break because we have horizontal and vertical asymptotes developed. Look here at this part right, right here. If someone were to tell you or determine the horizontal, vertical, and oblique asymptotes, you know you would look at n and m. These are things I've talked about in terms of my asymptote videos. If n over here is a zero, look, you really have 2, but x to the power of 0, which is really a 1, but n in terms of value of the highest order exponent or degree exponent in the numerator is a 0. In the denominator, you can say it's just a 1. When n is less than m, you have the standard horizontal asymptote of y equals 0. Hence, we have this y equals 0. What about vertical asymptote? What type of value can we put right over here, which would 0 out? or denominator because when vertical asymptotes you're looking at the zeros right the zeros of your function well how can we zero out our function you solve for this function here e to the x minus e to the minus x equals zero there's a specific value you can put what if you were to put zero e to the zero minus e to the minus zero you get one minus one and you zero out the denominator how do you zero out the denominator by looking at this value right here zero my vertical asymptote therefore must be x equals zero. So we have a vertical asymptote, we have a horizontal asymptote. Here's my vertical asymptote, the y-axis. Here's my horizontal asymptote, the x-axis. Hence the graph looks exactly like the way it does. And now we've analyzed it. Logically, the next graph to talk about this hyperbolic secant, which you would know would be the reciprocal. If I said the word inverse for the previous one, I was wrong. It's the reciprocal cosecant hx is the reciprocal of sine hx, secant hx is the reciprocal of cosine hx. How do we look at this in terms of its definition? Because the definition is what enables us to determine the characteristics of the graph. e to the x plus e to the minus x over 2, which becomes 2 over e to the x plus e to the minus x, right? We have to analyze the graph because it's an interesting activity and we're learning it. n over here, the highest order exponent is a 0. m, the highest order exponent in the denominator, you can call that a 1. You know when you have n is less than m, you have a horizontal asymptote, the standard horizontal asymptote, y equals 0. y equals 0, which is your x-axis will be your horizontal asymptote. What does a graph look like? There's absolutely no way you can zero out the denominator because if you put in zero over here, you get two over two, which is a one. If you feed in the value of zero in terms of your x, your y value, your output is two divided by one plus one, which is zero comma one. And that tells you, you're gonna have a graph which looks something like this. 
the highest point will be the zero comma one. But your graph is going to graze along this horizontal asymptote, which is your x-axis. And that, and now you see exactly what it looks like. So what's a domain? Domain here is minus infinity comma infinity. What's the range? Range is never below zero, but never including zero. But it's going up to a one and it's including it. So let's make this parentheses clear. We have a circular parentheses with zero, but we have a standard square bracket here with the one. And that right there is my range and domain. The landmark of this graph is 0, 1, and this is what the secant h looks like, the reciprocal. Remember, the cosecant hx looked like this. Well, this is what the secant h looks, looks like, the reciprocal of that. We have two more hyperbolic graphs to look at, and then we should be done with this video. So the last two graphs we'll look at are the hyperbolic tangent and the hyperbolic cotangent. We don't have to go too much into the explanation because now you know the gist of how the graphs are derived. Anyhow, you know the basic definition will be sine hx over cosine hx, which if you put the these basic terminologies into place and you simplify, you get e to the x minus e to the minus x over e to the x plus e to the minus x. When you look over here in the denominator, there's absolutely no way you can zero out. Hyperbolic tangent has no vertical asymptote. The horizontal asymptote can be determined by the fact that you know you have over here n is equal to 1, m is equal to 1, n is equal to m. So you have to use a specific technique to determine the horizontal asymptotes and you'll see horizontal asymptotes would be y, y is equal to plus and minus 1. I can show you how just for the time limitation or here, how we can get the y equals 1. In a likewise similar manner, you can get the y equals minus 1. If you look e to the x minus e to the minus x or e to the x plus e to the minus x right here, and we have a minus x here on the top. If you modify it to get rid of the minus exponent, you have 1 over e to the x. And do the same thing for the denominator, e to the x plus 1 over e to the x common denominator everything here you'll have e to the 2x minus 1 or this e to the x which i'm skipping you see this denominator e to the x i'm skipping it because this denominator e to the x they both will cancel out anyways so i'm not even showing that in the in here in this part right here we'll have e to the 2x plus 1 when you divide everything by the highest order or highest degree exponent which is e to the 2x you'll see how it plays out as it does minus 1 over e to the 2x over e to the 2x. This is just from the numerator part right here. Now let's look at the denominator part and divide everything by the highest order exponent. We'll have e to the 2x over e to the 2x plus 1 over e to the 2x. If you take x to approaching infinity, these zero out because you have a small number divided by an increasingly large number, you end up getting 1 over 1, which is 1. So that's just your 1 horizontal asymptote coming into play. But let's show you the actual graph because that's what we're really looking here at the graphs of interest. But you can see how this procedure is. This is how you determine a specific horizontal asymptote. And you know you've seen things like this in my asymptote videos. So we know that the hyperbolic tangent has no vertical asymptote, but it does have a horizontal, right here, y equals 1, y equals minus 1. And your graph would look something like this, right over here. The domain of this graph is minus infinity to infinity, but the range is this, minus 1 to 1 with circular parentheses because the graph is going up to but not including the values of 1 and minus 1. But this right here is your hyperbolic tangent. It's an interesting graph to know. We'll look next at the hyperbolic cotangent and that'll be it for this video. The hyperbolic cotangent, cotangent hyperbolic x. Easy graph to understand. Basic definitions here are cosine hx divided by sine hx. If you simplify everything using the basic terms, you have e to the x plus e to the minus x divided by e to the x minus e to the minus x. Now look, here you can actually determine a zero because you can zero out the denominator. If x is equal to a zero, if supposedly x was equal to zero, you would end up having e to the zero minus, and I'm looking here only at the denominator, minus e to the 0 which is 1 minus 1 and we'll get a 0. We'll end up getting a, a numerator divided by 0 we'll have an undefined value so you couldn't actually determine a y value so long as x value is 0 because we end up zeroing the denominator so we actually do have a vertical asymptote for this. The vertical asymptote for the hyperbolic cotangent is x equals 0.
You could do a, a likewise similar manner as we did before for determination of horizontal asymptotes because here n is equal to 1, m is equal to 1, n is equal to m, so you can do a specific horizontal asymptote determination. The horizontal asymptotes here again will be y equals plus and minus 1, and the graph will arise around this information that we have. You have the y-axis as a asymptote, you have these two horizontal asymptotes, y equals 1, y equals minus 1, and your hyperbolic cotangent function is something like this. What's the domain here? The domain here is minus infinity going up to 0, and then you have to go on the other side from 0 up to infinity. The range is likewise very similar, slightly different, minus infinity, but going up to here, minus 1, and then it picks up from here 1 and then it shoots up to a positive infinity and that's your range. But you can see right here is the hyperbolic cotangent and you know the hyperbolic tangent and I'm going to do it on the same graph, the hyperbolic tangent was right over here. The hyperbolic cotangent is the reciprocal of this. You can see this part right here shoots up this way and this part right here shoots down this way. So we have both the graphs shown over here. I'm just going to erase the hyperbolic tangent just for clarity's sake because I already showed you that previously. And the focus of this specific part right here is just the hyperbolic cotangent x. And now you have a new set of graphs to understand and to appreciate in this video. We looked at those quadratic type graphs where exponents increased in terms of the even character. Then we looked at the cubic type graphs where the exponents increased to higher odd numbers, right? Then we also looked at the inverse relationship between exponential and logarithmic, we looked at the inverse relationship between sine, cosine, and tangent, then we looked at the six hyperbolic graphs. Hyperbolic sine, cosine, cosecant, secant, tangent, and cotangent, and that should complete this video for us. I hope you enjoyed this video. Thank you for watching. Have a nice day.